internet and welcome to another episode of That's All I Have to Say About That Supreme Court Saturday. As always, I'm your host Stephen Mackey. Today we're talking about gerrymandering, the only time when people actually benefit from paying attention during US geography. Partisan gerrymandering is when you set up voting districts in a way that it intentionally and unfairly benefits one party, and leads to some districts that would look like what would happen if Salvador Dali were a cartographer. Now is that a district or did your pen just have a leak? Alright, so we've established that something suspicious might be going on here, but so far the only evidence I've actually provided you is that those districts are hideous. And changing redistricting laws based on the feng shui of a national map probably won't get you very far. On this Supreme Court Saturday episode, we're going to focus on a recent case, Gill vs. Whitford, where those redistricting laws actually went to the Supreme Court and see what the constitutional issues around partisan gerrymandering are. So let's get started with some background. Well, this Supreme Court story starts six years ago. A verbal assault by Senate Democrats didn't stop Republicans from passing a new plan to redraw Wisconsin's political boundaries. The controversial redistricting plan could be on the governor's desk within days. They succeeded and the districts were accepted. Now in most situations, this would fade into obscurity faster than doing the Harlem Shake. But this case reemerged five years later when it was announced that well, Wisconsin lawmakers might have to redraw district maps again. Three federal judges today ruling the state's redrawn maps are unconstitutional. Republicans redrew the maps in 2010. Since then, things have sort of been snowballing. Seven months ago, it was reported. The Supreme Court announcing they will take up a major case on political gerrymandering. Hey, that's you guys, Wisconsin. On October 3rd, 2017, arguments were heard on this case, and the news was all over it. Do we have a clip of the news that day? Everybody was talking about um, just all of the missteps that the I president got uh, so had many texts yesterday, yesterday in Puerto Rico. First of all, throwing paper towels at uh, the victims of the hurricane like it was a game. Yes, the first time the Supreme Court visited partisan gerrymandering and the news couldn't stop talking about Trump free throwing paper towels in Puerto Rico. Man, poor Supreme Court the forgotten branch of the US government. Just please don't start acting out for attention. Anyways, this is the case we're going to be covering today. But before we dive in, what is gerrymandering? Well, it's the fine art of grouping people based on their political beliefs into different regions. Kind of like preparing your Thanksgiving seating chart. Except, in this case, we're a little less worried about your uncle's misinterpretation of crime statistics triggering your cousin and a little more concerned with your congressman's misrepresentation of voters triggering war. The essential strategy of gerrymandering is to concentrate opponents into one district, so they win that district in a landslide, while your party spreads across the map, winning only 52% of the vote in maybe three or four districts. Think of it in terms of being a manager of a professional football team, which means you're the one in charge of hiring players. Now what gerrymandering does is it forces your opponent's team to spend all of their money on one star player, while you spread your money around to four or five decent players. Now I'm placing my bet on the full team every time. So let's dive right in. You'll hear argument first this morning in case 161161, Gill versus Whitford. Sorry, no puppies this time. Hey, I'm working with what I got here. Now this is a little more technical and nuanced debate than some of you might imagine. As you can imagine though, no one was particularly debating for partisan gerrymandering, except for this one weird moment. I don't think that necessarily means that districting for partisan advantage has no positive values. I would point you to, for instance, Justice Breyer's dissenting opinion in Veith, which has an extensive discussion of how it can actually do good things for our system to have districts drawn in a way that makes it easier for voters to understand who they are, account who the legislature is. It produces values values in terms of accountability that are valuable so that the people understand. Yeah, that never really came up again, but hey, good try. So let's get started with the first major issue. Does the plaintiff in this case have the legal right to bring this case to trial? Now this definitely feels like something that should have probably been cleared up before it got to the Supreme Court, but 
What do you know? It never came up. The candidate would have standing, and I, I'm not so sure about the voters in the district, but probably, but certainly voters in Milwaukee who don't vote for that candidate. They're not eligible to vote for that candidate any more than someone in California is eligible to vote for that candidate. We see this from the testimony of, of the lead plaintiff, who's the only uh, plaintiff that testified in this case. Uh, he was asked uh, during his testimony, what harm does Act 43 uh, put on you, given that you live in a democratic dominated district in Madison under any possible map. Well, he said, I want to be able to campaign for a majority in the assembly, which shows that his injury has nothing to do with him as a voter. Now, that really is an odd ethical question. Can you sue on behalf of someone to support your own ideas without their permission? That would be like me suing McDonald's for making other people fat. Now this point of contention was later clarified in the least clarifying way possible. When your claim is racial gerrymandering, it has to be limited to your district. You can't complain about racial gerrymandering elsewhere in the state. But here, if the claim is going to be political gerrymandering, you can raise claims about whole statewide uh, issues, uh, even if there is no argument that you're gerrymandered. Great, glad we got that all cleared up. W wait, what? So racial gerrymandering you can only sue from within your district, but political gerrymandering you can sue from anywhere in the state? Now that definitely doesn't sound like a law that Alabama passed in the 1960s to make sure everyone got equal representation. For those of you like me who are a little bit curious about the difference, take it away white male who gets oddly high and mighty at the end of his little speech. The law appropriately limits standing in that situation to people who live in the region of the state where there's an absence of, a, of an additional minority district. Uh, and you wouldn't want to assume that some African American from a different part of the state has a collective interest with people over here in this part of the state just because of race. That's just stereotyping. But with party, people join the party to, to, to work together to achieve a collective end. You know, I'm not sure how I feel about this one. Being a white male, I can certainly tell you from my last conversation with certain branches of my family tree that not all white people agree on all policy issues. For example, in my opinion, nuking Iran wouldn't be a terrific idea. That said, minority voting districts exist because apparently some people do agree enough to have some common beliefs. Now, the court wasn't here to solve the issue of minority representation today. We solved that one a long time ago. Am I right? <whistles> Alright, so anyways, this interpretation meant that the plaintiff did, in this case, have legal standing to bring this argument to court. Which brings us to the biggest debate. How would one begin to identify gerrymandered districts? This debate goes into a few separate issues. First, we have identifying a district that has been over gerrymandered. As you can imagine, this is a little more complicated than a Sesame Street rundown of looking at different shapes and deciding whether you like a shape or not. As I understand the efficiency gap test itself, and tell me if I'm wrong, that it would yield about a third of all the districts in the country winding up in not court. Sure. Now, th that's what the other side says, so tell me where that's wrong, and tell me what test you'd have this court adopt. Now this is one of those arguments that sounds smart for exactly half a second after hearing it. So what you're saying is we have this test to see how overly gerrymandered some districts are, and if we use it right now, a third of your districts will come up unacceptable. And your solution is change the test? That's like finding out you have an obesity problem and solving it by raising the minimum body to fat ratios. That said, the bigger problem with this whole Supreme Court debate is that no one even knows what standard to judge gerrymandered districts on. What criteria would a state need to know? in order to avoid having every district and every case and every election subject to litigation. Because the, the, the standards given in, in the lower court here was, well, a little bit of partisan symmetry problem, a little bit of efficiency gap problem, not a real set of criteria. And, and here, you know, is it 7 percent? How durable? How many um, elections would we need? How much data would we have to gather? This is a huge political problem because in this case, if the Supreme Court decides that they will regulate partisan gerrymandering, they not only have to agree on a way to judge it, but a standard for which electoral maps get sent to them. Just imagine it like a piece of art for a second. Now, I'm not going to say that gerrymandering is like art. Although Pennsylvania's 7th district really does evoke an image of young lovers dancing in the night. The tricky point here is that, at this point in our ability to measure gerrymandering, things are still surprisingly subjective as we'll get to in a second. 
You see, when it comes to detecting gerrymandering, our tests are about as reliable as a presidential health checkup conducted by one of his subordinates. So far, the metrics that we have, I mean, they identify false positives roughly 50% of the time. And I don't know how a legislature is supposed to comply with criteria that can't differentiate between a court-drawn map and a map drawn for partisan advantage. Now that is a really huge point, because you can't judge a district based on a test that's wrong half the time. At this point, I actually think it might be a good idea to go back to just eyeballing it. Alright guys, all non-geometric shapes are unconstitutional. Some causes of these unreliable results are... Isn't it true that you, you can get uh, very high levels of, a uh, very high EG based on factors that have nothing to do with gerrymandering. The, the political geography can lead to it, protection of incumbents, which has been said to be a legitimate factor, can lead to a, a high EG. Uh, compliance with the Voting Rights Act can affect that. Yeah, to have truly nonpartisan gerrymandered districts, you would have to do away with key parts of the Minority Voting Act because it requires that minorities be represented in minority districts that, unsurprisingly, are packed with minorities, diluting their representation in other districts, but strengthening their voting in the one district. Now, I can assume that that would not be very popular with, well, anyone. You also have to have people vote exclusively on party lines without factoring in any changes of mind, or else, uh-oh, you might have to redistrict. So basically, current tests are pretty terrible, but also... A plaintiff's expert studied maps from 30 years, and he identified the 17 worst of the worst maps. What is so striking about that list of 17 is that 10 were neutral draws. There were uh, court-drawn maps, commission-drawn maps, uh, um, bipartisan-drawn maps, uh, including uh, the immediately prior Wisconsin-drawn map. Oh man, I think I were on candid camera at that moment in the courtroom, except there are no cameras allowed in the Supreme Court, as you've probably noticed. The plaintiff alleging gerrymandering's expert witness studied 17 of the most gerrymandered maps, and more than half of them were created by the independent and nonpartisan commissions that would be left in charge of redistricting gerrymandered districts. What? So now let's hear the other side before I start a nationwide mob. If it's the most extreme map they could make, why isn't that enough to prove well, Your Honor, partisan asymmetry and unconstitutional gerrymandering? Uh, well, Your Honor, I think the facts in this case, which, which is uh, what you were discussing, are significantly less troubling than the facts in the cases that this court has previously faced, for example, Bandermer and Veith, and that's for two reasons. One, uh, the map drawers here complied fastidiously with traditionally district principles, which was not true in Bandermer and Veith. But they kept going back to fix the map to make it more gerrymandered. That's undisputed. The uh, people involved in the process had traditional maps that complied with traditional criteria and then went back and threw out those maps and created more, some that were more partisan. Uh, that's correct, Your Honor, and of course there were computers. So why didn't they them. take one of the earlier maps? Uh, because there was no constitutional requirement that they do so. They complied with that's all state law, point. and they complied with all traditional district principles. Wow, you weren't supposed to say yes to that. It's I do not recall. So anyways, the Wisconsin legislators had kept redistricting and redistricting until they hit the map that was just right. Which seems like it should violate some sort of law, but turns out it doesn't! Now it did get frightening at the end when regulators decided to make a buzzer shot appeal right to the judges. Gerrymanders now are not your father's gerrymander. These are going to be really serious um, incursions on democracy if this court doesn't do something. And this is really the last opportunity before we see this huge festival of new extreme gerrymanders all done al along the model of Wisconsin, uh, but probably even more serious. I, I, I would commend the political scientist brief, which talk about the revolution in data analytics that has happened since this map was drawn. You're going to see people coming in and, and, and slicing and dicing a very polarized electorate to the point where uh, one, one party control will be guaranteed. That's going to become the norm. Indeed, in any one party uh, state, if you don't do it that way, they're going to say, "Why? that's malpractice. Apparently, advances in data analytics are making it very easy to gerrymander an election, yet impossible to detect it, 
which probably has something to do with the fact that our regulators are so old, I wouldn't be surprised if their form of data analytics included an abacus. In the continuation of his appeal, he said equally compellingly, that politicians are never going to fix gerrymandering. They like gerrymandering. <laughs> this is, the problem in this area is if you don't do it, it's locked up. The voters of Wisconsin can't get it on the ballot without the legislature's consent. And that's true in most of the states that don't have commissions now. And so you have, we, we're here t t telling you, you are the only institution in the United States that can do, that can solve this problem just as democracy is about to get worse because of the way gerrymandering is getting so much you, worse. You, oh, man. Man, I think I need a clean pair of khakis. The Supreme Court is our only hope in not having every state be a foregone conclusion. What terrible options! It's either have the flawed test to regulate and create potentially worse maps, or unregulated gerrymandering. Oh, I feel like this is the 2016 election all over again. Never fear though, because here is the defense to calm us all down. We've heard something about the various tests that they're now uh, proposing. There was only one test that was subjected to adversarial scrutiny in this case, but a four-day trial. That efficiency gap test proved so fatally flawed that the district court rejected it as the test and plaintiffs abandoned it as the primary test on appeal. And then my final point about the scare tactics, about what will happen next. Plaintiffs' expert did a comprehensive study from 1972, at the, when the Baker redistricting had happened, to 2014. And it shows that the asymmetry was worse, was worse in 1972 than in 2014. There you're always going to have scare tactics. You're always going to have partisan intent. All right, can we just take a second? Who is this plaintiff's expert witness? Did he come recommended by the Wisconsin redistricting group? So there you have it. The essential arguments that the Supreme Court heard regarding political gerrymandering. It is expected that they're going to release an opinion this June. So until then, both sides kind of right. Let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll let you know what happens in the court. Until then, thank you for watching, and as always, that's all I have to say about that. Hello, YouTube. I hope you enjoyed that last video. For more episodes of Supreme Court Saturday, click here. Please like and click here to subscribe. And if you're really a fan, you can join our Facebook group. It's just a party over there.